Mark McMillan is, uh, is, is, you know, an excellent player, I think. I've, I've really been impressed with him. I, he's much better than I thought he would be, and we thought he would be good. I really like him. McMillan and Allen started together for two years in Philadelphia. They've drawn on that experience, and even though they've only been in camp a week, the communication between the two is excellent. Uh, some of the things that we do out there, you know, some people are kind of like, you know, they're kind of in awe because we don't, you know, throw a hand signal. It's just a, like a look that we give each other so we know what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, between me and Eric, it's just like an eye contact. I look over and see what he's going to do, and then I can pretty much read off of him. You know, and they seem to bring out the best in each other. There seems to be a little bit of competition between them to see who can allow the fewest completions. You know, and they, what I like about those two guys is even in practice, if a guy catches a ball on them, they're pissed. You know, they hate it, slamming their hands down. They, they don't concede completions, and in order to be great, that's what you got to do. Allen and McMillan are joined by another former Eagle in the backfield, free safety Greg Jackson. Their time together has allowed them to make that smooth transition. There's a couple of times I'll look, and you just, I'll just see you go like this, or, you know, or, or you know, we'll put your hand up, and, and that's all you need to say, yeah. and it's taken care of. Yeah, I, exactly, because they know where I'm coming from. They know what I'm talking about, and they know what I'm thinking about. So, I mean, that goes, that, that just goes back to, uh, you know, when we used to play against, play with each other. The fourth member of the Saints' revamped secondary is strong safety Anthony Newman. The nine-year vet actually joined the team last year. This season, though, he's the starter. Well, I knew my time would come around. Uh, you know, I've been in the league for what going on nine years now, and I know I can play. And and uh, this team was looking for some experience, and I've had some experience playing and, and starting. Uh, so I, I know I, I'm not a complainer. I'm just sitting around and wait for my time to come. And when it comes, I have to excel and and, and show them that I can play. He's a good guy to have back there. He's an experienced veteran that knows what it takes to be successful in the league. That's something this whole secondary has in common. McMillan and Allen both started on playoff teams. Anthony Newman, the same with the Rams. And Greg Jackson was the starter for the Super Bowl champion New York Giants. Between them, these four have 31 years of NFL experience. You know, these guys have won some football games, and they know how, what it takes to win games, and that's what we got to bring here to this program. The things that we're doing right now, and it's only been a week, and, and, and it's, it's scary. And he means scary in a good way, Joe. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And I can't tell you how good these guys look and all the drills, uh, the team drills, the one-on-one -on -one drills. We can't show you enough tape. These guys are good, and they're going to make a difference. No doubt about it. We're going to take our first break of the night. When we get back, though, it's been a rough week for Mario Bates. We'll tell you all about that coming up next on All Saints. Welcome back to All Saints, everybody. Mario Bates is big. Mario Bates is fast. Mario Bates is strong. He has the potential to become an all-pro running back. But as Jim Moore likes to say, potential means you haven't done it yet, Joe. That's right, Jim. And you know it takes more than raw ability to get the job done in this league. You've got to work. And Mario Bates has shown in the last seven days that he still has a lot of work to do. I've got so much work to do. Day one. After spending the offseason working with a personal trainer, Bates again fails the Striders test on the first day of camp. He bows out after the 11th 110-yard sprint, so now he's failed the conditioning run in each of his first three training camps. That wasn't my win. My legs just got tight. Maybe my legs just got too tired too quickly, maybe from warming up, uh, maybe not from stretching enough. Mario was a disappointment because he didn't make it. Uh, he did better than he's done in the past by quite a bit, but he didn't make it, and that's a disappointment. Day two, Bates bruises a calf in the morning practice and misses work in the afternoon. So after just two days of camp, the man tabbed to be the Saints' bell cow running back looks more like he needs to be put out to pasture. But to his credit, he faces the media despite the adversity, saying he knows it's up to him to prove what he can do. Just go out to practice and show everybody that I am in shape for football and that I am in shape. I screwed up and see that, see if they can put that behind them. And, and if they can, I know I'll be able to because I already have. The rap on Bates so far in his two years with the Saints is that he's soft and can't stand up to the pounding 
a feature back takes in the NFL. You see some great ability at times. You see some flashes of a guy that's got some special ability. I just want to see him do it more often and be on the field, you know, where he's not we just doing it, play after play after play after play, you know, just hanging in there tough. Day six, Bates shows some of the toughness the head coach wants. In the week's last day of practice, Bates runs hard and scores twice against the goal line defense. You know, goal line is all about toughness. And uh, the offensive line has some good blocking. And all I had to do was just slam it up in there and, and, and be kind of tough. And uh, that's what I did. Things looking up for the rest of this camp for you, Mario? Oh, yeah. All I can do is just get stronger and better. And that's what I'm looking forward to doing. Coach Moore has already said that Mario Bates so far has been immature. And what this is simply is a test of his maturity, Jim. And we'll have to wait and see if Mario has matured into that quote unquote bell cow running back that Jim Moore is looking for. Yeah, Joe, I think the bottom line is real simple. He is not going to be able to quiet his critics here in training camp. He is going to have to do it in a few games in the regular season and show the fans and the media and really this and coaching staff that he can go up and be that bell cow running back that you uh, so aptly described. <laughs> we got to take another break. When we get back, though, we'll talk to the Saints head coach, Jim Mora. Stick around. All Saints will be right back. Welcome back to All Saints, live from training camp in lacrosse. And this is training camp number 11 for head coach Jim Mora. And never, Jim, has he been under this kind of pressure. Yeah, you know, very few NFL coaches these days work with just a one-year contract. But Jim Mora doesn't seem to mind. He's been loose. He's been easy to deal with with the media. And this afternoon, I had a chance to sit down with the man himself. Join us now as Saints head coach Jim Mora. And Jim, first of all, you've been here a week now. What are your impressions on this club so far? We've had a great first week of training camp. Uh, they've worked really hard, and uh, their attitude has been excellent. Uh, you, you always start out training camp with some enthusiasm, you know, the first few practices, but these guys have, have not hit any kind of a, a lag period yet. Hopefully they won't. We've maintained that enthusiasm and really good work ethic through, pra through the week. Uh, other than a, a few injuries, you know, and then we have some injuries coming into camp, uh, we've stayed relatively healthy, and we've done more hitting than we did last year, so I'm pleased about that. But uh, I have, a, I, I think they're, I think we've had a good week, and uh, I like the progress that we've made. We put in a lot uh, mentally, the offense, defense, kicking game, and they picked it up well. So we're, we're making good progress. You mentioned the hitting. Uh, that's one thing that has really jumped out at me. Is it seems like it's been a little more physical at camp. Not that it wasn't physical before, but it seems like guys are maybe the linebackers are finishing off tackles and not letting the running backs just run through. It seems like there's been more hitting this camp for sure. Was that something? Conscious on your part coming into training camp? I see, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an, it, the hitting thing is kind of, it's kind of a fine line. You want to, you want to get the contact because it's a physical game, right, but you don't right. want to go crazy with it. You're going to get guys banged up and hurt, you know, in practice, and you don't want to do that, especially with, so, so these guys have done a good job. They, they know how to practice. They, they, uh, they, you know, they, the hits have been good. The physical contact's been good, but not, not, to the point where it's concerned me, you know, that we're going to get somebody hurt. So it's 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 been a good, a good tempo, really a good tempo. And uh, but uh, yeah, you're right that the, they have hit more than we maybe have last year, even the year before. The one thing I was talking to Greg Jackson the other day, and he said this uh, that's jumped out at him at the camp has been there are a lot of guys on this defense who are very explosive, really blow you up kind of guys. Is are you seeing some of that? We've got. Uh, better athletes on our on our defense than we've had the last few years and when you've got athletic talent then you've got explosiveness and pop and exp you know explosion and I see that you know when a, when a Mark Fields hits you there's some explosion when a Winford Tub hits you there's some explosion uh, and I could go on with other mm -hmm. people when a Wayne Martin hits you there's some explosion uh, Rufus Porter I mean you know and we've got athletes we've got guys that can run and when they're running and they hit you there's some pop and explosion so I would agree with uh, Greg on that assuming he can get into camp will he be able to get into the next week's game to get into the Hall of Fame game on Saturday if Alex Molden gets into camp the first part of this week like say gets going like Monday or Tuesday mm -hmm. or something like that I think I really believe that he'll be ready to play Saturday against uh, Indianapolis. We will work very hard to get him ready to play against Indianapolis so we can get him in the game and he can start getting that experience that he needs to get. I know he's in good shape, mm -hmm. so if he can come in and get some, get some time and, and not get hurt, not miss any time because of that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, he should be able to play against the Colts. 
I know every training camp you're enthusiastic about it. That's the nature of this business. But uh, it seems, just in my general observation with this coaching staff and the players, there's a real kind of quiet confidence that this can be a much better year than it was the last couple of years. Do you sense that also? Well, you know, we're not being picked as a major contender <laughs> this year in, in a lot of the preseason, uh, from the preseason prognosticators. But uh, I think we're being... Uh, and, and we haven't done anything yet. We've been seven and nine for two years in a row, so it's not like uh, you know we're uh, we've done anything the last couple of years to make anybody think that this year should be anything different. But uh, I believe it will be. <laughs> of course, we did that interview with Jim Moore a few hours ago. But uh, again. There is a confidence about this club, about this coaching staff that I haven't seen in the last couple of years in lacrosse, Joe. And I think the place that you can see that confidence the best, Jim, is on the practice field. Those guys are out there hitting, they're having a good time, they're having fun, they're kind of joking, but you know, there's that confidence behind it, like we're going to get the job done, we know we can, so we can go out there, have fun, pop some leather and get it going. Part of that may be that experience we were talking about earlier, the DBs or some experienced veterans here. But Lionel, it's definitely a new and improved Jim Morrow so far up here in lacrosse. Yeah, I tell you what, I think he feels a lot better about his defense this year, and uh, that's got him acting more pleasant. But I still believe that media seminar he was forced to attend is the key. Tom Benson realized Moore was doing nothing but hurting the Saints when he talked down to the media and talked down to the fans. I think the boss told Jim Moore to be good, and he has so far. Well, you're wondering what's going on with the Rams, Panthers, 49ers, and Falcons. We will update you on those training camps as we check in on the rest of the West, plus locals in lacrosse. New Orleans players trying to make it. That's all coming up next on All Saints. Welcome back to All Saints. Every week on the show, we'll keep you abreast of what's going on around the NFC West. We call it the rest of the West. And this week, we check in on training camp, stopping off first in Macomb, Illinois, where the St. Louis Rams are going at it. Macomb, Illinois. The St. Louis Rams reported to training camp on Friday with former Saints quarterback Steve Walsh scheduled to be the starter. Walsh didn't play a down last year, backing up Eric Kramer in Chicago, but he's confident he can get the job done this year in St. Louis, and he's already stepped into a leadership role. I've been with a couple different teams. I've seen a lot of different approaches. You know, I feel like you know I can be vocal if I need to be. Uh, I'm really not that type of guy off the field. On the field, I'm, I'm very vocal. Um, but I think just the work habits are, are usually the best thing to, that a leadership can show, and, and I think I have those. The Atlanta Falcons began training camp over the weekend with former Saint quarterback Bobby Hebert getting most of the reps in the first practices. Starting quarterback Jeff George is a no-show, involved in a contract dispute. And the 49ers reported to camp yesterday in Northern California. Second-year receiver J.J. Stokes looked good in the team's first workout. The number one pick last year struggled last season, but quarterback Steve Young says Stokes looks like a different receiver after the first few workouts. Stokes will start this year replacing the retired John Taylor. Next week, we'll see how Wesley Walls and Sam Mills are doing in Carolina. Right now, let's go back live to lacrosse now. Checking with Joe and Jim. And guys, there's nothing like hometown boys playing for the hometown team. No doubt about it, Lionel. The Saints already have not one, not two, but three. Michael Haynes, Tyrone Hughes, and Tommy Hudson. All those guys, they dream of their kids about playing in the black and gold. That's right, Jim. And there are two more locals who are trying to make it on the final roster, Alfred Payton and Corey Dowden. Saints cornerback Corey Dowden played collegiately at Tulane after prepping at John McDonough High School. Dowden says he's doing all he can in this training camp to make his lifelong dream come true. Being on, these, on the Saints team, I always, always was a Saints fan growing up, you know, going to all the games and stuff. And um, it just basically, you know, it'd be a drill for me, an honor to play for Coach Moore. The odds are against Dowden, however. After playing two years in Canada and the last three in arena ball, it's been a tough transition playing against NFL quality receivers, but Dowden has held his own. He's a tough guy. He's, uh, he's, I like Corey. Good kid. He's better than I thought he was going to be when we signed him. Former West Jeff star Alfred Payton is another native with dreams of playing in front of his hometown crowd. Uh, if I could have wrote it up in a script, I couldn't have wrote it up any better. It's, it's just been great. And uh, right now I'm on a, on, a, on a roller coaster and I'm just trying to ride it. So far, Peyton's been riding high, 
The Saints brass says he could be the camp sleeper because he's got an uncanny knack of getting to the passer. Payton comes to the Saints after playing five years with great success in the Canadian League. 82 sacks in 73 games. The Saints have taken notice and say the Gretna native may be able to find a niche. As a nickel defensive end, as a pass rusher, he's got some, some definite ability and has a chance. Uh, he works his tail off, he's tougher than heck, and um, he's got got a chance as a, as a pass rusher. I just need to go out there and, and, and play hard. Everything else is going to fall in place. And for me, yeah, I just need to just play hard and be focused. Dowden is a big hitter, but he is having trouble against those receivers. Alfred Payton, however, I think has a real shot at making this ball club, Jim. You may be right, Joe. Well, that's it from here in beautiful La Crosse. We are live on All Saints, and that's it for all of us. Later in this week, Mankato, and then next week, next Saturday, it's the Hall of Fame game, the Saints' first real test, and we'll tell you all about it on All Saints. All right, thanks, Joe and Jim. A lot of questions hopefully be answered this week, like how fast Alex Molden can pick things up and catch up to the rest of the team. We'll find out. That's it for this edition of All Saints. We'll see you in two weeks. Next Sunday, we'll show you the 1995 Saints highlight film at 930. For Jim Gallagher and Joe Trahan, producer Stephanie Couré, and for Tuckers, Dave Beatty and Albert DuPont, they made this, this thing happen. I'm Lionel B. Avenue. Good night, everyone. Tonight on All Saints, we'll check out the hottest battle in training camp as the Saints try and decide on a backup quarterback. And we'll profile the Saints' little big man, J.J. McCluskey. Plus, we'll take you on a trip of a lifetime with the kids to Canton. It's all coming your way next on All Saints. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of All Saints. I'm Jim Gallagher. My partner tonight in the studio is Joe Trahan. That's right, Jimmy. The Saints have had two preseason games, of course, against the Colts and the Lions. They've also had a couple of workouts with the Bears and Vikes, mm -hmm. and we're starting to see some things emerge now. No doubt about it. Jim Morris kind of getting an idea what kind of team he's going to have heading into 1996. And Fox 8's Lobby Avenue is still our man up in lacrosse, and he gets us started off tonight from training camp. Thanks, guys. We're here on Granddad's Bluff, overlooking the city of lacrosse, and the Saints have been here now for three weeks. They've got two preseason games under their belts, and it's time to find out just where this team stands. The record is one and one, but we all know that doesn't count. What counts is progress and how much the Saints have made. Time for an early state of the team address from head coach Jim Mora. He says right now it's hard to gauge where this team is. Well, as a coach, you know, you're always looking for perfection. You're always striving for perfection. You don't like anybody to make mistakes. You'd like to score 40 points and shut out everybody you play. But that, you know that's not going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the way we've worked. Very happy with uh, what we've accomplished. Am I happy? I'm not unhappy, let's put it that way. You know, I, I know that's probably a wishy-washy way to answer it, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, we, got, we got a lot of work to do. Well, I'll just put it this way. I'd be very disappointed if this team isn't better than the, the last three year teams we've had. Overall, in the first two games, Moore has been pleased with the defense. He says from what he's seen, they'll be much better than they were last year. But he said they made six bad plays against the Lions on Friday night. Two of those plays were made by the safeties, and they both accounted for the Lions' touchdowns. The two safeties are Greg Jackson and Anthony Newman. Jackson is an eight-year vet. Newman is a nine-year vet. Moore says they shouldn't be making those kind of mistakes. In a regular game, I mean, you make two or three bad plays, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're going to lose. And you don't want that. But, uh, but Greg and Anthony both uh, made a couple bad plays in the game that, uh, that hurt us. Now, the rest of the time, they did fine. But uh, we got we to gotta eliminate those. Offensively, the Saints have been emphasizing the running game. In the first preseason game, not very good. Mario Bates only had a 2.6 yard per carry average. Second game against the Lions, much better, says Mora. Bates ran well, along with Lorenzo Neal and Ricky Whittle. And Mora also pointed out Lorenzo Neal's been having a great camp as a blocker. I thought Derrick Brown had some very impressive runs in the fourth quarter. Lorenzo Neal ran hard and tough as always. Uh, Lorenzo, I thought, is, is having an excellent camp. He's blocking his head off. I mean, that guy's blocking him. He's a blocking, he's a blocking fool. You know, I always like everything to be better, but I'm not unhappy with it. At least we're getting good work at it, different types of plays and all. Well, that's it from lacrosse for now. We'll be back a little bit later to talk about the quarterback situation. Everybody knows Jim Everett is a starter. But the race for the backup has been pretty heated. We'll tell you who's in the lead in that race coming up a little bit later. 
Right now, let's go back to the studio in New Orleans. We'll see Lionel later in the show. Some other notes from camp today. Big news, Darren Mickle may be back as early as the Saints game against Kansas City mm -hmm. uh, on Friday. He could be back with the team, then return to New Orleans. Also, the walking wounded have returned to the practice field. Cornerbacks Alex Molden, also uh, Mark McMillan, tight end Paul Green, and running back Ray Zellers all back on the practice field. And, Jimmy, you know just how important that is. They need the reps. They need the time yeah. to gel. I was up in Detroit, and believe me, this team needs to get <laughs> McMillan and Molden if they're going to handle like somebody like that, uh, that run-and-shoot offense the way the, the Lions play. They definitely need to get those two cornerbacks healthy. we got to take our first break, but stick around. Up next, I'll profile the Saints' J.J. McCluskey, and we'll catch up with former great Danny Abramowitz. Stick around. Welcome back to All Saints. He is 5 foot 7 inches tall. He weighs 177 pounds. By NFL standards, J.J. McCluskey is a little man. But on Sundays, he becomes an assassin. He is the hunter, relentless in his pursuit. He will take on any opposition to get to his one goal. What's your goal as a special teams player? What do you hope to accomplish this year? My biggest goal is the last two years, I've, I've felt like I've been overlooked for the Pro Bowl, and I've had the stats, and I've had the plays, and uh, I feel like I'm, I'm Rodney Dangerfield in it right now. I'm, I'm getting no respect, and until I get my respect, I'm going to keep on working hard, working hard, working hard, and until I get to the Pro Bowl, you know, that's going to be my main goal. JJ's ticket to the Pro Bowl lies with special teams, but he's hoping this year to make a contribution on defense as well. It's good for J.J. that we've finally allowed him to settle into a position. He came here as a wide receiver. We moved him to corner. We moved him back to wide receiver. We moved him to safety. He's been asked to do a lot of things. This year, he's settled in at corner. He's really competing well. You know what J.J. is going to give you everything he's got every play, so you don't worry about that. I think I've come along well. Um, you know, I think the technique part of it is uh, the main thing that I've, I'm not doing right now. I'm basically, I'm, I'm playing corner on just being a competitor, mm -hmm. not wanting to get beat and uh, just want to be aggressive. And I think as soon as I get better with my uh, um, technique, then I can be a good corner in the NFL. With Eric Allen, Mark McMillan, and Alex Molden all at cornerback, JJ's best shot at playing time is on special teams. But he's not complaining. I'm not here because uh, I'm the best cornerback uh, on the team or one of the best. Uh, I bring something to this team, and that's on fourth down and at the beginning of their game, at the end of their game. And um, that's my role, and you have to, you know, you have to know your role, and that's what I do. You enjoy the role? Oh, definitely. So I love special teams. Uh, you get a lot of action, can be physical. Um, you, have to, you have to know what you're doing as a special team player. And uh, since I've been in the league for a while now, knowing that and it's, it's becoming fun, it's becoming a little more easier for me. You ever look back and say, man, if I was only about six inches taller, I'd be... <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to lie, I do that all the time. My dad's 6'4", and I'm wondering, you know, what happened? <laughs> Imagine J.J. McCluskey at 6'4". Now, you may not win a championship with 40 guys like J.J. McCluskey, but every winning team has to have three or four guys just like him. Now, the first Never Say Die Saints player was wide receiver Danny Abramowitz. Danny is now the special teams coach of the Chicago Bears. In fact, he is one of the best regarded special teams guys in the National Football League. But despite spending the last four years up in Chi-Town, Danny told me this week he will always call New Orleans home. Well, 25 years of my life was spent in New Orleans. My family was raised there. Uh, it's some, something special in my heart. I uh, spent a lot of years in my career playing for the Saints, enjoyed catch, coaching a Jesuit, and uh, miss all the food. <laughs> <laughs> more, more, more than anything else, yeah, right? Right. You can get a piece of beef up here. That's oh, about yeah, it, right? Uh, you know, they said fresh seafood. I said, must be fresh off the truck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Danny told me that's the one thing he misses more than anything about New Orleans is he goes, you know, you can get a decent piece of beef, but you really can't get any good seafood up there. Of course, Danny, a real class guy. Whenever you see the Bears on the national shows, they're always talking about him. What a great job he does. Luckily for the Saints, we've got one of our own back here, Bobby April, who's 
going to do a good job with our special teams this year as well. As you know, they're very important. No doubt about it, Joe. we got to pause for the calls, but stick around. Up next, 16 New Orleans youngsters get the trip of a lifetime. All Saints will be right back. Welcome back to All Saints. Imagine being an eight-year-old, getting to meet your favorite players, getting to see the NFL Hall of Fame, and getting to travel across the country while eating pizza. For 16 youngsters from the Crescent City, this was truly a dream come true. Lot of the Avenue and photographer Albert Dupont take us on the trip of a lifetime with the winners of our Kids to Canton contest. Right. Central Monday morning rail. Fifteen cars and fifteen restless riders. Three conductors, twenty-five sacks of mail. The kids to Canton began their odyssey on a rainy Wednesday in New Orleans. But the rain didn't seem to bother the kids who feasted on Domino's Pizza while on their way to see the greats of pro football and some future Hall of Famers as well. But for these kids, getting there aboard Amtrak's City of New Orleans was half the fun. It was scary at first because it was my first time hearing on when it was shaking. And I knew, and I knew. And so after a while, it, it just was fun. Um, my favorite part about the trip was the train ride. Never been on a train before, and you didn't have to wear seatbelts. And we got to go to sleep, and we got to stay up late. The train ride was great. Slept good. Good morning. The first stop of the trip, Thursday morning, the kids to Canton awoke to Chicago's famous skyline. 58, got a slow approach going under the big top freight rail. After pulling into Amtrak's Union Station, it was time to explore the Windy City, including a stop at one of the world's tallest buildings, the Sears Tower. After taking in the sights of Chicago, it was back to Union Station to board Amtrak's Capital Unlimited for the final destination, Canton, Ohio. Hey, welcome to Canton. Day three, Canton, Ohio and the Hall of Fame, where the greatest in pro football are enshrined. Former Saints are honored here, like Doug Atkins, Jim Taylor, and 1995 inductee Jim Finks. The kids also got a glimpse of the past and former greats like Y.A. Tittle, Vince Lombardi, Mike Ditka, Terry Bradshaw, and O.J. Simpson. Oh, they're the ones. Okay, great. Great. Then it was time to meet the Saints and get their favorite player and coach's autograph. Walked around and got autographs on my hat. Um, it was real fun. It was exciting meeting the Saints, and I really enjoyed it. After touring the Hall of Fame, it was time for dinner with who many feel is a future Hall of Famer, former Saint Ricky Jackson. You having a good time or what? Yeah. I also want to thank my very good friend. I like to call him the City Champ, but the rest of you guys know him as Ricky Jackson. Yeah. After dinner, the kids got to spend a little time with Ricky on the way back to the hotel. I was rapping for Ricky Jakes. He asked me to rap for him. And I was rapping for him. <laughs> What's the most fun thing you've done so far? Well, we were rapping with Ricky Jackson on the bus. Ricky Jackson and hanging out with him, eating and playing with him on the bus. 
Day four, game day. But first, it was time to induct the 1996 class to the Hall of Fame. For the group, it was a chance to witness history and honor greats like Leroy Kelly, Joe Gibbs, and Dan Deerdorf. I played for the St. Louis Cardinals when they were in St. Louis. Finally, it was game time. Time to watch the Saints and Colts do battle. The train ride was fun. Um, we went to the um, Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame games, I'm sure, is going to be fun. We're there right now. Getting ready for what? <laughs> to watch them win. Bates carries, knocked down by Quentin Coria. That's a first down for New Orleans. Unfortunately, the Saints didn't have the same luck as the Kids to Canton winners, but despite the loss by the home team, it was unanimous. I had a great time. Thank you for the New Orleans Saints. I like the and train ride because it's my first time today, on a train going to Chicago. We'll have a chance to win to the one of these special the footballs. Yes, I had a lot of fun. Unquestionably, the thrill of a lifetime for those young kids. I mean, they were completely set up. Yeah, I got a chance to meet those kids when we were up in Canton, and believe me, I just want to know one thing. When do I get to go next year? <laughs> exactly. Well, folks, when we get back, we'll check out the rest of the West, and we'll get an update on the Saints' backup quarterback battle. As we go to break now, take a look at all the kids to Canton winners. Welcome back to All Saints. It's time now to check out the rest of the West, and we start in St. Louis. The former LSU speedster Eddie Kinnison made his debut in Rams camp this week. Kinnison, who held out for a five-year, $5 million deal, says he's just trying to fit in. Just basically getting everything in, uh, getting caught up, you know, from two weeks when, that I wasn't in camp. And uh, just learning everything, what's going on, you know, taking the process every day after practice, getting a little extra in and uh, just catching up to speed. Kinnison's fellow first rounder, Lawrence Phillips, also reported to camp and made his debut in the Rams preseason opener against the Steelers. Phillips gained 17 yards on six carries as the Rams lose 16 to 10 to the Steelers. The Carolina Panthers unveiled their new home, Erickson Stadium, last night. New mascot Sir Purr watched his team host the Bears. Eric Davis gets the pick early and returns it 36 yards for the TD. The Panthers win easily 30 to 12. The Falcons, still without holdout QB Jeff George, took on the Seahawks. Former St. Bobby A. Bear gives to Jamal Anderson, who does the rest. Anderson bulls his way in for the TD from 29 yards out, but the Seahawks come back to win at home 19-17. And the 49ers were at home this weekend against the Broncos. Bad news for Saints fans, QB Steve Young looks to be in midseason form. He gains a chunk of yardage on the keeper, then guns one into his favorite target, Jerry Rice, for the touchdown. But the Broncos score late to win that ball game, 20 to 17. And of course, when you talk about the rest of the West, the thing that is scary, Jimmy, is how good the 49ers looked when uh, Young and Rice were hooking up. That's going to be something that uh, our defensive backs will have to watch for as we do every year. September 1, write it down, <laughs> brother. Right. It's going to be a big one. By the way, those uh, 49ers uniforms look pretty nice, too. <laughs> Jim Orr was hoping Friday night's game against the Lions would help sort out his backup quarterback situation. Instead, it confused things even more. Fox 8's Lombie Avenue has more from training camp in lacrosse. Thanks, guys. We're talking about the backup quarterback battle now. And a check of the stat sheet from the Lions game, it shows Tommy Hudson clearly had the upper hand in this battle. He threw for 88 yards, including a touchdown. Doug Nussmeyer looked very comfortable, finally getting a chance to work with the first-team offense. He threw for 48 yards and ran a touchdown in. Hugh Millen, the man they brought in to be the number two quarterback, well, he's struggling. He was three for five, had trouble, just like he had in the first game against the Colts. Millen is the only quarterback who was not with the team last year. And in the first two preseason games, he's a combined three of seven for 22 yards. He's been sacked twice and thrown three near interceptions. How would you grade yourself right now in terms of this training camp and, and, and how far you need to come? Well, you're always your own worst critic. And, and um, I'd like to get in there and, and get a chance to get in a rhythm. And, and I, I think that 
the opportunities have been relatively brief for me, and, and uh, so, you know, the, the nature of the game, you get in, and sometimes uh, it takes maybe a series or two to get going, and then uh, by the second quarter or something, you're, you're, you're starting to feel, uh, uh, get into a comfort zone and a rhythm, but um, of course, the way we're breaking things down, uh, that isn't always possible. We feel that we need to get Hugh more playing time, just get, get him more snaps, more repetitions, more opportunities to go in there and do it and he'll, he'll be fine, but right now he's, he's a little hesitant. Five-year veteran Tommy Hudson of LSU has gone 17 of 33 for 167 yards in the two games. Hudson looks comfortable in the offense, picking away, taking what the defense gives him until the big one opens up. I'm trying to make it hard to, uh, for, the, for somebody to get cut anyway. Um, and that, that's uh, what I'm here for is to try to play well as I can and, and um, uh, when training camp ends, hopefully I'll still be here. Third year player Doug Nussmeyer may be in the lead right now. Although his stats may not be as good as Hodson's, he has shown vast improvement this training camp. Plus, Nussmeyer adds that Steve Young factor, rushing for a score Friday night against the Lions. He's more comfortable, he's more confident uh, as our quarterback making more plays, more efficient plays. He looks like he knows what he's doing more. It's a great opportunity. Anytime you get that opportunity, you want to go out and seize it. And, uh, you know, he, he, those guys are great players. And it's, it's great to get in the game and then play with the ones. And, uh, you know, that's what I always look forward to. But Mora is giving no indication which quarterback he thinks will be the first into battle should Jim Everett go down. I'd say it's pretty even with all three of them. I really can't, uh, I don't think there's any clear cut uh, clear-cut uh, distinction. I'd say it's pretty darn close. A Saints offensive assistant coach told me that they really are going to give Doug Nussmeyer a chance to win that number two job this year. Also look for Hugh Millen to play a lot more in the game coming up against the Chiefs. The Saints want to see if he can get comfortable with the offense and he needs more reps to do that. All right, that's it from lacrosse. Let's go back to the Fox 8 studios in New Orleans with Jim Gallagher and Joe Trahan. Guys? Lionel, thank you very much. I'm going to put it to you this way. Here's the way I look at it. Right now, Hugh Millen is clearly behind Hodson and Nussmeyer. Put it in the bank, though. <laughs> Count on it. Cash that check. Hugh Millen will be the backup quarterback. They put a lot of money into a signing bonus. He's got the big contract. Unlike the guy last year, he is healthy. Hugh Millen will be the number two guy. So the battle, really, is for the number three spot. And the other thing about Hugh Millen, he's played in the third quarter both times. He mm -hmm. hasn't had a chance to get on with the front line people, so it's hard for him to kind of build that rapport that right, you need right. to look good and, and look fresh when you're out there on the front line. And as you said, it'll, it'll either be Nuss or Hudson for that third position to see if they can make this ball club, period. Three more games. We will see how it all shakes out. That's it for this week's edition of All Saints. Next week, we'll wrap up that Saints-Chiefs game from Kansas City, and we'll profile the pride of Chalmette High, special teams coach Bobby April. For Lionel Biamidou and lacrosse and Joe Trahan, here in the studio, I'm Jim Gallagher. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next Sunday night right here on All Six. Tonight on All Saints, we'll look back on the debacle in Kansas City, problems on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. Defensive end Darren Mickle finally joins the Saints, and we'll hear from him next. And we'll go one-on-one -on -one with local boy made good, special teams coach Bobby April. All that, and we'll check out the rest of the NFC West action. It's all coming your way next on All Saints. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of All Saints. It was, in a word, brutal. The Saints' 42-6 loss to the Chiefs last night was the worst preseason loss for the Saints in 24 years. I'm Jim Gallagher. With me, my tag team partners, Lionel Bienvenu and Joe Trahan. And guys, I haven't seen a beating like that since Jerry Cooney stepped in the ring. It was <laughs> <laughs> ugly last night. Peter McNeely, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, Jim, you don't put too much stock in a preseason win or a preseason loss. You look for encouraging signs and improvement, but I saw neither from the Saints last night. Hugh Millen looks like the Chip Low Miller of the quarterback group. Mario Bates is as durable as a piece of glass, and nobody has stepped up to fill the shoes of Quinn Early. The team had better get better by September 1st. Yeah, Joe, it was rough. That's for sure. You know, you don't want to push the panic button in preseason, and I didn't after the first game or the second game. But in this game, Jim Everett stayed in there deep into the second quarter, and he still couldn't get the offense moving. Four first downs, that's nothing. And, and it would be different if it was like the first couple games when we really didn't get a chance to see the first teamers too much. Right. We saw a lot of them, and they did a lot of 
Nothing. Right. You talked about the offense. Let us get started with the offense. The Saints continue to struggle, as Joe said, to put points on the board when the first teamers are in. Last night, the Chiefs' defense dominated the Saints. Four first downs, 126 yards of total offense, four turnovers. The Saints' offense suffered through its worst performance of the preseason last night in Kansas City. A fresh reminder to all of us that uh, if we go out there and, and don't perform uh, up to our abilities, we're, you're going to get your ass kicked. Uh, that's the way this league is, and, and we did not perform up to our abilities on, uh, on either side of the ball. Everett and the first-team offense did put six points on the board, thanks to two long field goals from Doug Bryant. But the first-teamers have failed to score a touchdown in any of the three preseason games. When they don't score, it's uh, it's not good enough. You know, you'd like to see them get some get some points, get some touchdowns, and uh, we're we're working to, to to improve that, and we'll keep working to do it. And hopefully, by uh, the time the season rolls around, uh, we'll be better and, and able to get in the end zone. You know, I look at it last year, and we were successful the first half of every game, and we started off 0-5 in the regular season. So. Uh, you know, uh, we have been successful in practices. We uh, hopefully that will, will pan out into the games, and, and hopefully it's uh, you know, we're not saving the best for last or anything like that. We want to try to get in there, and uh, uh, you know, Hasty made a great play on uh, on, uh, on uh, Torrance Small. Otherwise, that would have been a touchdown. But uh, you know, it was a good effort. Those guys we knew uh, playing Kansas City that they were a very very tough uh, squad. We watched them kick uh, kick uh, Dallas right, in the and, and they got after us. The running game was virtually non-existent. The Saints rushed for 28 total yards, an average of just 1.8 yards per carry. Backup quarterback Hugh Millen continues to struggle. He was two for five with a pair of interceptions last night. I have not lost any confidence in Hugh. I, I think he's going to be fine for us. My confidence level is fine. Um, I'm not going to, you know, situation. You're getting a couple of hand, handful of, uh, of plays in a, in a preseason game, and I'm not going to let that, you know, uh, wh whether it goes great or whether it doesn't, um, a handful of plays isn't indicative of anything. Guys, remember this, though, and you do have to temper some of the negativity with the fact that the Cowboys played the Chiefs <laughs> last week, and they didn't score a touchdown either. So, right. you know, the Chiefs are a pretty good ball club. And they are a Super Bowl contending ball club. The best point is we don't have to face them in the regular season. <laughs> right. right, but you do have to play the 49ers, right. and uh, they got problems on the running game. They got problems on the passing game. They got problems on offense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may be right about that. We've <laughs> got to take our first break, but stick around. Next up, the Saints will welcome Darren Mickle into the fold. And... Saints defense could certainly use and we'll have that right after this. Stick around. <laughs> Welcome back to All Saints. Darren Mickle has missed the first four weeks of training camp. Not because of injury, but because he has been battling substance abuse. Now, a lot of you, you were there when Mickle reported to training camp with the Saints today. Yeah, Jim, he walked in very somber, very apologetic, ready to put his problems behind him and play football. But it might not be that easy. He's cleared to practice and play, but a suspension is probably on the horizon for what appears to be his second violation of NFL rules. <laughs> Getting Darren Mickle back at camp is just the first victory in a long battle. Mickle faces at least a four-game suspension for violating the NFL's substance abuse policy. Neither Mickle nor Saints general manager Bill Kuharik would confirm or deny the reported suspension. But should it come down, Mickle would not be able to practice or attend meetings or do anything at the Saints facility. Mickle could appeal the suspension, and while the appeal is being heard, he would be able to practice and play. Mickle said today the looming suspension is not what he's thinking about. Our main concern was for me to get back here and be the best person, the best player I can be. Um, anything else had to come from NFL, you know, other announcement. Mickle looked great at minicamp during the summer, showing the pass rushing ability that hooked the Saints into signing him to a three year, $5.1 million deal. In four seasons with the Chiefs, Mickle has 13 and a half sacks, 5.5 last season after sitting out four games with injuries and losing his starting job. As a starter the year before, he had seven sacks. In 93, he had only one. His potential is great, 
but his problems were greater. Mickle wouldn't say exactly what he sought treatment for, although he mentioned alcohol and marijuana. I mean, I did some things I shouldn't have been doing. Um, it's not important on uh, what it was. I mean, if you get out of hand doing something in a situation and you get out of control, it can be alcohol, marijuana, it can be anything. I mean, you just got to realize when you need help, and I felt like I needed help. I feel better than I ever felt in my life. You know, I'm having more confidence in myself as a person and um, as a player. And, um, it made me, all this made me appreciate uh, life and just and what football means to me. Mickle hopes to start practicing tomorrow, and he wants to play against the Bears on Saturday. Coach Jim Morris says he'll wait and see what kind of shape Mickle is in before the coach throws him into the fray. Mickle was not able to do much in the four weeks he underwent treatment. I'm going to have to sit down and make a decision as to how ready he is, how quickly we want to get him back in, uh, uh, how soon do we want to put him out on the field doing full stuff, uh, uh, do we want to get him ready for this week, whatever, what, what kind of shape he's in until all of those decisions are made and we have all that information, then I can't, I can't make a final decision, but I don't think it'll be too long. Mickle seems very repentant. He seems ready to get on with his life and get back to playing ball. And he asked us to respect him and his personal life and allow him to fight this ongoing battle without outside interference. I just want to just think on, on the positive things now, you know, and just contribute. I mean, I know you guys got a job to do. I mean, um, I can, I'm not going to try to interfere with that, but um, I just hope that this would be the last time, you know, we talking about it. The sooner Darren Mickle can get into the Saints lineup, the better. The Saints defense can certainly use the help. Last night, the Chiefs rolled up some big numbers against the Saints' number one unit. You just want to burn the film in this one, you know, and try and, uh, uh, you know, go on and, and, and just figure out what was the problem and fix it and go on to the next game. It was the worst preseason defeat of a Saints team in 24 years. The Chiefs rolled up 27 first downs, 42 points, and over 330 yards of total offense, most of it against the Saints' first team D. Yeah, most of us played uh, uh, late into the uh, third quarter. And, uh, you know, they had their second and third string guys in, so pounding the ball at us and uh, just took advantage of us up front. I think uh, maybe we were looking for the boots or something, and they just came right at us. Like I said, uh, did a great job coaching. You know, they changed their whole game plan from last week. We didn't see not one boot. Uh, they came at us with some really off tackle and things like that. So uh, luckiest preseason. <laughs> with Mark McMillan and Alex Molden on the bench, Tyrone Hughes started at corner and the Chiefs completed pass after pass on him. Within the second quarter, my legs weren't there at all. You know, I mean, guys were pulling away from me. Uh, I really wasn't able to come out of my breaks, but once the like, third quarter or towards the end of the second quarter and third quarter, I was able to get them back and uh, felt pretty good. I think I did a pretty good job, except for that one time down uh, right before they scored, the, uh, when the guy did the curl route. Uh, he was able to sit down, and I just didn't come out of it quick enough. Now, you don't get 27 first downs just by throwing the football. The Chiefs rushed for over 170 yards last night, averaging almost four and a half yards per carry. You got to do the job up front. You got to make the tackles. And uh, you, you just got to do what you got to do to win. And uh, it just didn't happen tonight. Um, thank God it wasn't a regular season. But you can't take pride or, or take anything um, positive out of, uh, out of a um, score like that in the preseason. A couple of things I think you got to look at, and I think the most important thing is this team's got to get healthy. You know, you look at, if you have Stokes in there, if you get Darren Mickle, hopefully he'll be able to get back onto the field soon. You get McMillan, who should be playing next week, Alex Molden, who should be playing next week. It's kind of a different defense, and I think some of those, a lot of those problems are very solvable. Yeah, you like to hear, Coach Moore likes to use the word correctable, Jim. He says things are correctable. Tackling, there was bad tackling again last night, but that's correctable. I think when you get Tyrone Hughes out of there and get uh, Mark McMillan in there, That'll solve some problems in the passing game, and you get Mickel and Stokes in there, as you talked about, Jimmy. I think things will come around for the defense. Yeah, Joe, you got to get that penetration, too, up front. Yeah, you got to get the defensive line working, getting after it. Another big thing, I think, though, is the gel factor. We talked about it on our first All Saints show about a month and a half ago. This defense has to get together and gel. That secondary, especially, did not look like they had gelled at all. There were some big holes. So they got to get the guys who were hurt back in and gel before September 1, or Steve Young and Jerry Rice will torch this team. It is two weeks in county. we got to take another break, but stick around. We'll talk about one of the positive parts of last night's game, the special teams. And we'll profile the man in charge of the special teams, the pride of Chalmette, Bobby Abel.
Welcome back to All Saints. It is a long way from assistant coach at Chalmette High School to assistant coach in the National Football League, but Bobby April is a hometown boy done good. Stop right. You can see it on his face. Bobby April enjoys his job. For him, coaching is simply a way of life. You seem to really enjoy keeping it enthusiastic. I mean, a lot of special teams coaches are like that, but but you know, having been around three or four of that, that you really do the enthusiasm is a big part of your coaching style, isn't it? Yeah, I'm enthused. I, I, I guess so. I'm just. I guess I don't know. It's hard to explain because it's just that's just that's me. just the way you that's are. That's just me. It? So I don't know how to categorize how how it is or how it happens. It, it just happens. I'm kind of elated to be there and, and so honored to be there that I can't help but uh, being excited. So maybe that's part of it too. Uh, just to be down there on that field is exciting for me. But of course, it always has been. It was exciting for me to be on the field. Shelmet High School and, and <laughs> Ted Gormley and everywhere I've ever been. So it's carried just, you pretty far, hasn't it? it? It it certainly has for me. Yeah. Shelmet High School. It's where it all started for Bobby April. It's 1971. 18 year old Bobby April is a standout defensive player for the Shelmet Owls. 25 years later, and he has come full circle. They say you can't go home again, can you? Oh, yeah, it's been, it's been tremendous for me. I told Coach Moore right before the game started. I wanted to say, thanks for having me here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, it's, I've been on cloud nine myself, uh, talking about my parents since I've been here. It just, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to coach for him. and I uh, hope we can, you know, do everything we, we have our sights on. Last season, Pittsburgh's special teams helped the Steelers get to the Super Bowl. Bill Cower wanted Bobby April back last season, but he turned down a long-term deal to take a one-year contract with the Saints and Jim Mora. When you made the decision to, to leave Pittsburgh, a, a lot of people looked at it and said, wait a minute, he's leaving a Super Bowl team and a team that's a <laughs> potential Super Bowl team again to come to the Saints that haven't been a Super Bowl team. Uh, what was your thought process of making that final decision to say, hey, I want to make the move back? Well, there, there wasn't much of a process. So when, when they contacted me and wanted to know if I was interested in coming here, I immediately, I immediately was interested. I immediately knew I, w I wanted to come. I didn't think about the, you know, the one loss records or anything like that. And then when I reflected on what I actually do, it the, the thing that, you know, I've, I've known Coach Moore a long time mm -hmm. and I've got great respect for him. And then I was con thought about the team and to go from 0-5 and, and do what they did, generally when you go, the, at best, when you start out 0-5 in this deal, at best you can kind of stay the same. Now you're gonna nickel and dime a couple of wins in there mm -hmm. because everybody's good. Uh, but but they but I, I in looking at the team I thought they just got better and better and better, and with him coaching and with that character on the team uh, and the youth of the team, even when Wayne uh, the wins and losses I, I thought it was an excellent move. Think about it though you're talking about a guy who left the Super Bowl team to come to the New Orleans Saints. That says a lot for his character and it says a lot for Jim Moore because Moore's character to be able to attract a caliber coach like Bobby April. And the Saints are absolutely glad they have him. You could see it already. The special teams are greatly improved. Mm -hmm. You saw in the kick returns last night, really the only positive, and also Doug Bryan, he's got him in gear. A couple big kicks last night. Bobby April will make a big difference for the Saints ball club. Hey, the main reason he came back, the <laughs> parish. Guys. The I'm pride of Chalmette. Having lived in the parish, uh, <laughs> living in Chalmette, I can understand the attraction for April to get back here. They love him down there. He's home. And he's doing a great job, and I guarantee you, St. Bernard is watching the show tonight, so we <laughs> want to say hello to you guys there. There you go. Well, Joe, you mentioned some positives. If you're looking for positives, you don't find many, but you said the kickoff returns were one. Derek Brown stuck out as one of the few bright spots. Brown returned the opening kickoff 58 yards to set up the Saints' first field goal. On the night, he had five kicks for 156 yards on returns. That's the latest notch on his training camp belt. He reported to camp less bulky and quicker than last year. He's running the ball very well. And his game last night is more proof that he belongs on this Saints football team.
Definitely. I, I don't care how I get the chance, you know, offensively um, or kickoff returns, special teams, whichever, you know. Anytime I, I, I get a chance, I'm going to make the best of it. And uh, tonight we made it. I think we, we did well on special teams as far as the kick return aspect. Just watching Derek Brown give it 110% and watching Mario Bates leave the field every three <laughs> plays, even in practice, if I were a Saints coach, I'd feel much better giving the ball to Brown, somebody who looks like he wants to play, Jim. Yeah, I don't think uh, Derek Brown's the bubble boy anymore. I think he's definitely got this team made. He seems a lot more relaxed the last couple of weeks right. being around him. I think he feels like he's got this team made, and he can make a lot of valuable contributions. Yeah, he's come up. He's made some big plays. He got the touchdown run, a couple big kickoff returns, nice screen plays. He'll make this ball club. All right, guys, we got to take our final break. But up next, we'll check out the rest of the NFC West. All Saints we will be right back. Like football. That's a contact sport. You got to get out there, circulate, communicate. Don't hesitate. Call Radio Phone. Radio Phone knows performance is everything. You just can't phone it in if you want to win. Life is a contact sport. Whose team are you on? Yeah, I like to have 57 cheeseburgers, 57 fries, oh, and a Diet Cold drink. The summer invasion isn't over yet. They make me do things. Who is they? Nothing you've ever seen. The Martians are coming. The Martians are coming. Nothing you've ever imagined. Why don't you see them for what they are? Can prepare you for what's coming. That thing in your head is tuned into their collective consciousness. I can see what they're planning. Scott Bakula, Richard Thomas, Elizabeth Pena in a miniseries event. The Invaders begins Monday on Fox. Parental discretion advised. Bill Yacht Pest Control has served the New Orleans area for nearly 60 years. For environmentally friendly pest control, call Bill Yacht Pest Control. Get a three-ton high-efficiency air conditioning and heating system, just $16.95. Call Keefs for all of your air conditioning and heating needs. Don't let this happen to you. Tunes can install a carbine remote auto alarm with starter kill shock sensor and light flash, just $149 at Tunes. At Pro Engine Sales, you can have a motor installed in your car for as little as $19.95 a month financed. Call Pro Engine Sales. The rest of the West is brought to you by Toyota. It's out there. The new RAV4 from Toyota, starting around just $15,400. Welcome back to All Saints. It's time to check out the rest of the NFC West, and we start in Atlanta. After a couple-week holdout, Jeff George and the Falcons came to terms on a one-year deal. He reported to camp earlier this week. You know, all that's behind me. It's, uh, it's over with. All that's on my mind is football now, and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Uh, not excited about the weather, but excited to be here and uh, ready to get the ball rolling. George was on the sidelines when the Falcons faced the Bucks last night. Trent Dilfer threw for a TD pass as Tampa Bay beat George and company 16-zip. Elsewhere, there's a QB controversy brewing in St. Louis. Ex-Saint Steve Walsh was just 7 of 12 for 92 yards. Meanwhile, rookie QB Tony Banks moved the ball club well. Banks hands off to rookie Lawrence Phillips, who scores his first TD as a Ram. St. Louis wins 17-10 over Jacksonville. The Panthers faced the Broncos last night. Kerry Collins finds former St. Wesley Walls for the TD, but Collins would struggle later throwing three interceptions. Denver comes back to win it 40 to 28. Finally, the 49ers took on the Chargers right here on Fox 8 last night. Steve Young sprints out and he can't find a man. That's no problem though. He pulls it under and scrambles down to the two. Then check out Young showing off some fancy footwork near the stands. That run would set up a one-yard TD. The Niners would win it with a field goal in OT, 16-13 the final. And that's the rest of the West. 
We mentioned the Saints defense having to gel, as you saw Steve Young there. He and Jerry Rice are hitting on all cylinders so far in this preseason. So if the Saints defense, especially the secondary, doesn't get things together when they get Molden and McMillan back together, as I said earlier, uh, Steve Young will have a field day with this ball club. Right, no doubt about it, Lon. Yeah, but I think, uh, as Jim, as we talked about, uh, everybody's in preseason. We talk about how bad the Saints offense look. We talk about how bad the Saints defense look. But they do have two preseason games to get it together. Uh, they may have been tired from camp. The other night camp was breaking. Some of their minds may have been on that. You mentioned that, Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, it's too early to kind of, you know, put an 0-5 start on this season. But, uh, <laughs> right. but, oh, but totally what you want is somebody to look good, and they did not look good last night. Sure, but you could be in Carolina right now. Kerry Collins, your starting quarterback, threw three interceptions last night. And people, they don't have Bianca Batuka in camp. So, right. I mean, you also, you could look around the rest of the league, and there are a lot of other teams that are having some problems in, in their training camps, too. So this is not the only team that's having a little problems in training camp. The key, I think, again, though, is, as you talked about it, getting these guys healthy, getting them to gel together. They've got two more home games, which were very important. I think finally get back into friendly confines of the Dome. A lot of time left for this team to really get their act together. I'll be interested to see what happens when the Saints do get a chance to get back home in familiar territory. And the bottom line about this is that's why it's preseason. These games don't count, and hopefully the Saints can erase some of their mistakes. The record will be 0-0 come September 1st, and they can move forward. And defensively, you're looking at Stokes practicing this week, Mickel practicing mm -hmm. this week, uh, Molden and McMillan will play next week against the Bears. So things are looking up for the defense. But you go back to offense again, Doremus and Small are going to have to start mm -hmm. playing better. Uh, Quinn Early has gone, and nobody stepped up to fill this hole just yet. I think you're right, no doubt about it. Well, that is it for this week's edition of all Saints. Next Sunday night, we'll be back to, re to review the Saints-Bears game. It's the first home pregame of the preseason. It'll be nice to get back to the Superdome. For the entire Fox 8 sports team, Dave Beatty, Albert DuPont, Stephanie Coure, Corey Johnson, Lionel B. Avenue, Joe Trahan, I'm Jim Gallagher. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next Sunday night on All Saints. Tonight on All Saints, the offense explodes against the Bears and a star is born at tight end. Plus, we'll profile a pair of rookie defenders, Alex Molden and Brady Smith. Both are being counted on a big way this year. And we'll check out the rest of the NFC West. Plus, the Saints have an anniversary get-together. It's all coming your way tonight on All Saints. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of All Saints. And what a difference seven days can make. A week ago, the Saints were coming off their worst preseason performance ever under Jim Mora. Last night, they rebounded with one of their best. And joining me, as always, to break down the game are Lionel Bienvenu and Joe Trahan. And Lionel, let's start with you. Well, Jim, the offense showed signs of life last night that had been missing in the previous three games. I think it was because the first teamers got extended playing time and because the Saints hit big plays early. The long pass to Lusk, the touchdown to Haynes, those kind of plays provide momentum, and the team feeds off of it, so plays... Big plays like that are so important, and the Saints use them to beat the Bears. Joe, to me, the key was definitely playmakers last night. That's right. That's a big deal. Welcome to the new NFL. Of course, today, Kansas City, actually yesterday, Kansas City gets beat by the Rams because Eddie Kinnison makes big plays. And as far as the Saints go, they made big plays last night after a blowout to Kansas City. They needed to make them. They get the job done. Henry Luss turns a 50-yard uh, reception into a 72-yard reception when he makes a great move on the run after the catch and of course Haynes turns what would have been an interception into a touchdown. They get the, the big plays early, also make plays often and they get a big win. Well the Saints defense did play well last night but that's not unexpected. They have played well in really two of the three exhibition games. The first team offense on the other hand though hadn't scored a touchdown in any of the first three preseason games at all. But last night Jim Everett and company broke out in a big way. The Saints offense finally broke open last night against the Chicago Bears. After failing to score in the first three preseason games, the Saints first teamers rolled up 28 points in just three quarters last night. 
we got kicked last week and uh, uh, we were awful and we, we we had to come back and the team responded they responded this week uh, you know they were embarrassed uh, mad uh, they, they, they wanted to play again we came out and uh, you know we made some big plays we've been talking about being, making play uh, who's going to be the playmakers uh, we came out we, we talked to each other about hey let's let's get together as an offensive unit um, let's be productive and efficient and we were all those so it was uh, uh, it was an enjoyable evening out there and it was it was fun to be a part of it Jim Everett threw three touchdown passes in this game but none bigger than his first to Michael Haynes in order to score points in this league you have to make plays guys have to to make plays you have to step up and make plays and that was a, a good example of that so that makes a big difference in the game I mean you know big praise uh, big plays spark the crowd and when the crowd gets into it it's nothing like being at home with the crowd on your side so you know big plays is what it's all about you can make the big plays the whole team get uh, kind of pumped up and uh, they'll go out and make big plays themselves Back in the, high again. the Saints led this game 21 7 at the half came out and put together a 17 play drive that culminated with Everett's third touchdown pass of the evening. The drive took up over 11 minutes and gave the Saints a 28-7 lead. Well, what was that, a 22-play drive? I, I don't think in all the years I've, I've been in the, the NFL that a 22-play or 23, whatever it was, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely long. But, you know, we had the, the great part about that drive is we had some adversity in it. You know, we had some penalties, moved us back. We kept fighting, kept fighting, come down and finally get that touchdown. That, uh, uh, hopefully that's going to be typically uh, what the Saints are all about. That's a very good defensive front we played against them. We got after them pretty good, but uh, it's just a stepping stone. You know, we got to work hard this week against Minnesota and get ready for the 49ers. One thing we didn't talk about was Henry Luskin, that piece, and we'll talk about him a little later on. But I think William Rofe makes a very, very good point. Last week, you couldn't get too low after the loss to Kansas City. This week, you shouldn't get too high after the win over the Bears because the bottom line, again, is it is just preseason. Right. Wins and losses don't matter, Jim, but uh, signs of improvement, signs of progress. That's what we were looking for in the preseason. Hadn't seen it on the offensive side of the ball, but at least last night, you have something to build mm -hmm. on. They scored some touchdowns, made some big plays, broke out of that slump. And now they've got to continue it on because it doesn't stop here. Right. That's right. And the other big thing is the fact that they built confidence. And that's always important for the preseason. That's what you need to get that springboard going for that season opener against the Niners. And it's coming up closer yes, and closer. Is. Time now for our first break. But when we come back, we'll switch sides, look a little bit closer at the defense. And two rookies that Saints fans will be seeing a lot of this year. Alex Molden and Brady Smith are next when All Saints continues. Welcome back to All Saints. Defensively, the Saints' first team held the Bears to a total of seven points in full three quarters of action. Now, last night's game was the baptism under fire for number one pick, Alex Molden. He did come up and make a big hit and a big play in this game, but Molden also had a big miss. In the fourth quarter here, Jack Jackson beats him badly for the 36-yard touchdown pass. Talking with uh, Eric Allen and uh, and Mark Camilla, and they said, "Hey, yo, you know, welcome to the uh, welcome to the NFL. You know, that's going to happen. You just got to bounce back and and, uh, and and learn from your mistakes." It's the nature of the business, like in any other business. You know, you're going to get beat, and uh, there's going to be situations where it's just, hey, it's, it's time to make a play. But uh, you know, it's preseason. We have a lot of film work to do uh, and look at. And he's going to get better, and uh, it's it's a situation where it happens to all of us, and it's and it's not going to be the last time. Now, Joe, I understand the guys I was talking to yesterday, they were coming up to the sideline on Alex and, and just basically saying, hey, you are not an NFL cornerback <laughs> until you've given up your first. Forget your first pick. you got to give up that first score first. That's right. It's the NFL. He will get better, though. This guy has got an excellent attitude. He's also a smart guy. And I promise you, Alex Molden will have a great future. Here's the Saints' number one man on draft day. But after holding out, defensive back Alex Molden made his first rookie mistake on his first day of practice. He re-aggravated a thigh pull that he failed to tell Saints coaches about. Well, first, you know, I was late to camp. And then to tell the coach, hey, you know, I kind of pulled my hamstring about two weeks ago. I think I might need a little time. You know, I should have did that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, but I didn't. And, um, you, know, I, you know, it was a mistake. But that mistake has set the tone for this thoughtful young player. 
After missing two weeks with the quad injury, Molden knows he must make up for lost time and make every snap and practice count. And he's getting quality help to that end. Veteran corners Mark McMillan and Eric Allen have taken the youngster under their wings. It is, without a doubt. I remember uh, I'm on draft day. Uh, once I found out, uh, Eric Allen, Mark McMillan, oh, what? This is, oh, this is, you know, this is going to be nice when I get to learn from the best. Everything's been flowing very smoothly in, in practice, and uh, I can't say enough about how Alex is kind of, he doesn't seem like a rookie, you know. He seems like a mature guy out there. He understands what's going on. <laughs> hey, that's say, you know, I'm, I mean, that's something special, you know, for him to say that. Um, but, you know, I love this game. But before this love affair can bloom, Molden has got a lot to learn, as we saw last night against the Bears. He's a long way behind. He missed a lot of time, and that has certainly hurt him. But he does have athletic ability. You can see that. He seems to be pretty smart, and uh, he just needs to play. You know, he, he just needs a lot of repetitions. And that's just fine with the first rounder out of Oregon. He knows he's been blessed with exceptional athletic ability, and he's ready to do what it takes to make himself a better player. The odds of, of somebody making it to this level is, you know, are great. So, you know, that's, you know, I think it's a gift, you know. And I'm not going to just sit on that, though. I'm going to try to make myself better. I love the game and I respect the game, and I'll do anything to make me a better player because I want to be the best. All right, another rookie that's seen action on the defense is Brady Smith, but he's found the going rough in the NFL so far. The Saints' third-round pick out of Colorado State hasn't had the luxury of a grace period as his pro career begins. With Darren Mickle and Fred Stokes unavailable as of now, Brady's been thrust into the starting lineup, but he is back down from nothing. He has taken the bull by the horns. And that you do stand your ground and, and that, you know, you don't take anything off anyone and, uh, you know, kind of prove yourself that, that you're going to be a tough guy and you're going to be a guy that can be dependent on, on on Sundays when the ball is snapped. Would respect be a good word in that, in that aspect? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Smith has started all four preseason games at defensive end. He's had no time to learn from the veterans, no gradual indoctrination into the league. And it hasn't been easy. Smith is trying to overpower and get through veteran offensive linemen who might outweigh him by 40 pounds. He doesn't uh, have the size and the strength uh, that it's going to take to be a dominant player in the NFL or even to be a real good player in the NFL physically uh, to compete. But uh, he's a scrapper. He, he fights uh, to, to, uh, to, to try to take on the blocks as best he can against those 300 plus uh, offensive tackles. And, and he's holding his own. You know, I've always been quote unquote undersized uh, you know I'm 260 and you know that's that's probably a little bit undersized but I mean there's there's just no time to think about that you know that's not what I'm thinking when I'm out there on the field you know I'm, I'm thinking about my techniques and hand placement and, and getting to the ball and making plays and so uh, you know the, the size and the, and the strength thing that that's what you think about in the offseason that's what you work towards in the offseason if Darren Mickle doesn't make it in the uh, lineup by September 1st you'll be starting in San Francisco against the 49ers. Have you thought about that? Is that in the back of your mind at all? You know, that would just be uh, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity and challenge for me. And, you know, I'm ready to face that head on right now. And, uh, you know, San Francisco 49ers, I mean, that's about, that's about as big of a test as you can, as you can get in, the, in this league because they're, they're one of the top teams every year, year in, year out. So, uh, you know, I look at it as just my role is to get in there and, and take the things that I learned on the practice field and take them out there on, on game day and, and use them and just and, and play the best I can. You might outweigh Brady and push him around a bit, but you will not outfight him. And he'll fight through the season a little overwhelmed, but look out next year. After an offseason of weightlifting and strength training, he's going to be a good one, guys. And Jim Moore said today, uh, good news, injured veteran Fred Stokes might be able to play against the 49ers. That's right. It wasn't a calf pull as they originally thought. He actually had a burst cyst 
on that calf. He should be ready to practice this week and play maybe against the 49ers. Yeah, right? and ideally, I think what they need to do is they need to get Brady Smith at that other position, get him behind Ronaldo Turnbull, where he doesn't have to take on the tackle and the tight end. <laughs> he's got two sacks already playing out of position. He can, he's going to be a real warrior in this right. league, no doubt about it. We've talked about a pair of defensive rookies. Last night, offensive rookie tight end Henry Lusk shined. And we'll hear from him coming up, plus a sensational reunion. That's next after we take another break, so stay tuned. Welcome back to All Saints. Jim Mora said today he had been surprised by two players this training camp, quarterback Doug Nussmeyer and rookie tight end Henry Lusk. Last night, Lusk ignited the Saints' first team offense. I was just running my heart out. You know, I didn't know the guy was behind me, you know what I'm saying? And uh, Derek Brown was, was coming up on the other side. He was telling me, Henry, you know, you know, pick your feet up, pick your feet up. I couldn't even hear him, you know, and after I got tackled and I saw how close I was to the goal line that I was upset. But I was glad that I had got a chance to move the ball for the offense and that we actually got a chance to score. Henry Lusk didn't score a touchdown last night, but he did make a big impression with Saints fans. The rookie tight end caught five passes for 100 yards. Not bad for a guy who played five different positions at Utah. The Saints took him this spring in the seventh round the 246th player taken overall. They're usually the kind of guys, you know what I'm saying, that, that, that come in and probably play special teams and that's, you know, nothing else. Or maybe don't even make the team. But, I mean, I came in here with, with, with my head open and with my, you know, with my intensity to go out here and play football and, and to show these guys that, you know, you drafted me, you took a chance to get me in New Orleans, and I want to show you that I'm here to play football for you. Lusk has been a real pleasant surprise for us. I mean, this guy's going to be a good football player, a seventh-round draft pick. Lusk's biggest moment came in the third quarter. Bear safety Mark Carrier tried to take his head off, but he popped right up and came back later in the series with a catch that set up the Saints' fourth and final touchdown of the evening. He's a tough kid. He's, he's a competitive kid. He got the dog knocked out of him that one time, and he took a wicked shot. And he comes back, you know, bounces up and comes back the next play or a couple plays later and makes a big a, a key catch. And, Guy's got a great attitude. He loves to play. He's a tough kid. Let him know, you know, Mark Carey is an excellent free safety. You know what I'm saying? I was just letting him know that, you know, here in New Orleans, in our own home stadium, you ain't going to knock no New Orleans Saints football player out. He ain't going to get back up. And that was my main focus. And uh, that's what I try to prove to him. To quote Jim Moore, the guy is tough as a boot. He really is a, just a find. I mean, they talk about the fact he's not a real great blocker yet, but, you know, Kellen Winslow isn't in the Hall of Fame because he was a blocker. <laughs> he's there because he can catch the football, and this guy can catch it and do something with it afterwards. We're talking about catching the football, Jimmy. 16 receptions for 207 yards. That leads all Saints receivers in the preseason. I mean, yeah, the guy can catch the football, but as we talked about, the thing that really stuck out was that hit. He got the dog knocked out of him and <laughs> came back and caught another pass. And that's what a coach wants to see. He wants to see toughness, a guy that's going to come out and give it his heart. And Henry Lusk has a lot of heart to go along with that, Joe. He sure does. And he's willing to do anything it takes to get better. He's a seventh-round draft choice. He wasn't touted very highly coming out of college, but he has the smarts. He's also got the, uh, I guess, the personality to get the job done in his position. He's a great guy to work with. We met him in training camp, and we all agree. Steal of the draft. Well, remember, the thing that people talk about is that plateau. A lot of rookies look good early on, and then they level off. This guy is probably, in my opinion, has gotten better. And, I mean, those are the guys you look at things, hey, you really do have something when they get better as training camp goes on. And, and Henry Lusk has, no doubt about it. you got to see a guy making progress is the thing you want to see in training camp. All right, guys, we're going to switch gears right now and talk about 1987. That was the year the Saints recorded their best record ever. They went 12-3 and in the strike season and made it to the playoffs for the first time. Also that year, we witnessed the birth of the Saint Sations, and last night, they celebrated the 10th anniversary of that dance team. 22 of the original 27 Saint Sations were on hand for last night's reunion show. For most, it was hard to believe it had been 10 years since they first stepped onto the field. For Saint Sations choreographer Angie Wagasback, a member of that 1987 team, it was a very special evening. To be part of the original team and then to make the step into choreographer and then to put this whole thing together, it's really a special time for me. 
For original member Ava Allen Marshall, it was a chance to renew old friendships forged on the field when the Saints were having their best years. A chance to relive the best of times, even though some things have changed. Some of the girls from back in 87, we were talking about it. We gave it a name. It's called the Three O's. We feel old, we feel overweight, and we feel out of shape. The halftime show featuring 83 past and present dancers had its share of connections. First-year dancer Ashley Hughes was a student of teacher Ava Allen Marshall's at De La Salle High School. Ashley was only eight years old when Ava first stepped onto the Superdome floor. I had known that she was a former sensation, and it never occurred to me until my um, senior year in high school, and she wanted me to try out so bad because she thought I danced well, and she's the one that really pushed me to it, and I'm happy that she did. I'm really grateful to her. And Rebecca Levine was a student of Angie's at her Donaldsonville dance studio. Being from Donaldsonville as Angie is, um, I've heard stories of her and came and watched her dance for years, and it just made me want to do it. So I came out as soon as possible, graduated from high school, came out, tried out, and I'm here tonight and dancing with her again. We've got to take one more break, but when we come back, a look at the rest of the West, where we find former LSU Tiger Eddie Kinnison making some huge plays for the Rams, and former St. Wesley Walls doing the same for the Carolina Panthers. All Saints will be right back, so stick around. Brought to you in part by Don Bone Ford and by Radio Phone. Welcome back to All Saints. We are now exactly two weeks away from opening the NFL season. And how are the Saints rivals doing? Let's check them out in the rest of the West. In Pantherland, ex-Saints tight end Wesley Walls is turning heads left and right. First with his play in camp, then last week he hauled in this Kerry Collins TD pass. Walls says he knows it won't be easy but he's looking to improve on his career high of 57 catches with the Saints last year. I'm going to tell you, 57 is a, is a good year, a real good year, and it's, it's going to be hard to beat that. But uh, I'm going to be dissatisfied if I, if I don't, and I'm going to work my butt off, and I'm just going to – I got a little motto, I do my best and live with the rest. The other big news from Charlotte, first-round pick Tim Bianca-Batuka ended his holdout. He was on the sidelines as the Panthers hosted the Bills last night. Panther QB Kerry Collins couldn't get it going. He gets intercepted twice, and Buffalo shuts out Carolina 24-zip. The Rams were in Kansas City last night. The Chiefs dominated the Saints last week, but couldn't stop the former Tiger Eddie Kinnison. In all, Kinnison grabs three TDs as the Rams handled the Chiefs 34-30. Jeff George showed no ill effects after his contract holdout. George completes 17 of 24 for 233 yards, including this TD strike to Eric Metcalf as the Falcons soar past the Raiders 27-6. And at the Niners camp at Santa Clara, the San Francisco defense is looking for a lift from veteran free agent Chris Dolman. The Niners picked up the all-pro defensive end from the Falcons to help shore up their D-line. The 11-year vet says the situation is a good fit, especially at this stage of his career. And you have an old guy like myself who kind of, you know, balances everything out. I don't feel that I have to, you know, pull the load anymore or, you know, be the big show horse. Uh, you know, we got four guys that can rush the passer and four guys that can play the run quite well. Doman and company have been doing just that against Mark Brunel and the Jags tonight. They had a couple sacks early. That defense is looking good. The Jags are leading 24 to 10 right now in the fourth quarter. But that's just preseason. <laughs> you, you talk, yeah, exactly. Preseason. 49ers getting beat by the Jaguars. The Cowboys have won one preseason game. Defending champs, they're injured. Hey, you got to throw preseason out the door, but you have to look for your players to play well, and the Saints did last night. Right, and I think the main key for any team right now is just get your guys healthy, get into the regular season, and then at least you've got a fighting chance. And, you know, the Cowboys right now, they're in trouble with them at Smith, so right. as long as the Saints get their guys healthy, I think that's the most important thing right now. That's going to do it for this Sunday's edition of All Saints. The team has one more preseason game left. 
That's next Friday night in the Dome against the Minnesota Vikings. Then it's on to San Francisco to start the regular season on September 1st. Now we'll be back here next Sunday night to tell you all about the Vikings game and we'll preview that big matchup with the Niners. Hope you join us then. Until then, from all of us here at Fox 8 Sports, good night, everybody. Now, this is something we had fun with last year, so we are bringing it back. It's your opportunity to call play by San Francisco. We'll get the Saints' thoughts on the 49ers. And we'll be joined by the newest member of the All Saints team. Ricky Jackson will join us for his weekly analysis. And we'll look back at Friday night's dramatic win over the Vikings. All Saints is coming your way next. Look, everybody, welcome to this week's edition of All Saints. The preseason is over, but the games begin. I'm Jim Gallagher. With me, as always, are my Fox 8 partners, Joe Trahan and Lionel B. Avenue. And guys, let's, let's get busy. Well, Jim, <laughs> uh, this is where it all begins. The 49ers next on the horizon. As always, the most used word right before the season begins is if. If Darren Mickle and Fred Stokes can play, if the defense is as good as Jim Moore says it can be, if the Saints can run the ball like they did against Minnesota, if these things happen, <laughs> The Saints could be a good team this year. We'll get our first indication one week from today, Joe. We also got uh, some good signs from the game this weekend against Minnesota. A couple things that stuck out for me. First of all, the secondary. That was Warren Moon. Remember him? Last year, he blistered the Saints secondary. Of course, it is much improved, and it proved that in that preseason game. Also, the running game looked pretty good. Mario Bates, uh, more than six yards of pop. And that's what the Saints are going to need to do well against San Francisco. Yeah, every day you talk about ifs and nuts. If, if every day was ifs and nuts, every day would be Christmas. So you always <laughs> got to be worried about that a little bit. But uh, hopefully they can jump out to a good start. Yeah, the ifs will become uh, the what's coming right. up this Sunday. For what it's worth, the Saints ended up the preseason 3-2. and two, Really worth nothing now except when it comes to confidence and momentum. And that means a lot as a team goes into the season opener. Saints players and Saints fans can take something from last Friday's win over the Vikings. And that is a winning feeling as the Saints head for San Fran next. The Saints, like every other team in the league, are 0-0 zero and zero going into the regular season. But don't tell the players this one didn't count for something. I think it's always positive when you win, you know, just like uh, the Kansas City game. You know, we took something away from it when we, when we got beat bad. Uh, so you have to take something away from a, a positive preseason. I think we played pretty well this preseason. The Saints must build on the positives from the Vikings game, like the running game. The Saints gained 144 yards on 26 carries, a 5.5 yard per carry average. Mario Bates got 58 yards, and Derrick Brown rushed 434. Anytime you go out and average six yards a carry, you know, yeah, right. against a defense like Minnesota, you're doing a pretty good job. I mean, our offensive line and our running backs did an excellent job in the running game. This was the, probably the best that I've seen it. It was an asset, and uh, I thought that uh, those types of things were, were which helped put us in a position to win. The second team offense, directed by Doug Nussmeyer, sputtered and coughed until the last drive when they moved the ball 36 yards in five plays with rookie Ricky Whittle accounting for all of the yardage. That drive ended with Brian's 53-yarder, a test under fire that the Saints passed. It's not about uh, numbers or anything like that. It's about winning ball games. And, and when it was time to get it done, we had some guys step up and make some plays. Ricky Whittle comes in a game and, and makes some great plays, and, and that's what it's all about. Defensively, the Saints can build on taking the ball away from the Vikings four times on interceptions. Alex Molden, Richard Harvey, Tyrone Hughes, and Brian Jones all had picks. Giving up yardage to the Vikes, but not giving up points and stopping Minnesota when it counted. This is a great momentum builder, you know. Uh, I mean, this is one of the things that we wanted to get, you know, um, a lot of turnovers. Again, I can't control injuries, but if we stay healthy, this football team defensively will be better than we have been since 1992. That 92 defense was number two in mm -hmm. the NFL, and that's why the Saints went 12-4 and four that year. And Coach Moore just told us the key to the season, Joe, injuries. If they stay healthy, they have a chance to be good. 
That's right. You got to keep those linebackers he healthy, especially especially Tubbs, Porter, and Mark Fields. They stay healthy. They'll get some things done. Well, you know they're going to see a lot of action this week because of the 49ers. You know they're going to be throwing those defensive backs, that defense. If you're going to get tested, might as well get tested right out of the gate, Joe. That's right. Let's move on now. And all NFL teams today had to get down to that 53-man roster limit. The Saints did that by making three cuts, releasing another player, and making a trade. The Saints waived wide receiver Terry Guess, a fifth-round pick in the 96 draft. They also cut offensive tackle Alan Klein and defensive lineman Israel Stanley. The Saints also terminated the contract of veteran defensive lineman Tory Epps, who is now an unrestricted free agent. Then they traded an undisclosed draft choice to the Oakland Raiders for Austin Robbins, a defensive tackle who comes in at 6'6 and weighs 305 pounds. Robbins was the Raiders' fourth round pick in 94. He played in 18 games in the last two years, making 21 tackles and two sacks last season. And he also returned this fumble for a touchdown against the Eagles. The Saints, of course, trying to upgrade that defensive line. Of course, Tommy Hodson came into training camp once again this year as a long shot. He was battling veteran Hugh Millen. Millen played badly this preseason. That's an understatement. Hodson, though, as usual, was steady. He was efficient. That was good enough to keep him on the Saints as the third-string quarterback. I've been a long shot for two years, and um, but I, I've played well. Uh, I've played well in practice and in the games when I've had an opportunity. Um, so I, I don't know why I should be considered such a long shot, but I guess uh, people just keep doubting. But uh, just glad to be here. Good news for Tommy Hansen, no doubt about it. All right, enough about the preseason. We got to take our first break. But up next, we introduce you to the newest member of the All Saints team. Ricky Jackson will join us to talk about this week's game against the 49ers. Stick around. All Saints will be right back. Welcome back to All Saints. This Sunday, the Saints will open the regular season against the defending NFC West champion, 49ers. We're proud tonight to introduce you to the fourth and final member of the All Saints team for 1996. And he is a man who is very familiar with both the Saints and the 49ers. He is arguably the best player to ever wear a Saints uniform. For 15 years, Ricky Jackson played the game at its highest level. He was named to the Pro Bowl six times as a New Orleans Saint. He holds team records for most sacks, most games played, and most games started. In 15 years, he missed exactly two games because of injury. In 1994, Ricky left New Orleans, and he signed with the San Francisco 49ers. Ricky earned a Super Bowl ring that season, and then last year, at age 37, he led the NFC West champions in sacks. This offseason, Ricky came home, and he retired as a New Orleans Saint. And September 8th, he'll become only the fourth man to have his name etched into the Superdome's Wall of Fame. Tonight, we introduce the newest member of the Fox 8 All Saints team, Ricky Jackson. Join us now is Ricky Jackson. Ricky, it's great to have you with us. The man called City Champ, and it's nice to have you with Lionel and, and Joe and myself this year. Well, I've been with you guys for a long time, and uh, you're my homeboy from back home together, and I'm uh, just proud, you know, to be around. Let's talk a little bit about this game. I don't think more than anybody else probably in the country knows more about the Saints and the 49ers than you. You played for years with the Saints. You're back now with the Saints in, in a front office personnel capacity. Certainly played the last couple of years with the 49ers. You know their team very well. So let's get in and talk a little bit about this game. First of all, when you talk about the 49ers, the guy you got to think about first, Jerry Rice and Steve Young. Let's talk about those two guys first of all. Uh, well, both of those guys are... Uh... They're a good combination. I mean, Steve always looking for Jerry. Jerry catch a whole lot of balls and more. You know, they're trying to beat the Dallas group with Michael Irvin and Troy Aikman and them, so they work together pretty well. You practice against these guys. You played against these guys. What makes them such a good combination? I think the timing. Everything is, both of them two great athletes, but the timing with these two guys is, uh, you know, very effective. Yeah, they, they really seem like they're always on that same wavelength. A lot of guys don't have that, uh, that special rapport, but they really do seem to have that together. Well, Jerry the man the ball, and uh, Steve like to throw it to him, because once Jerry catches the ball, he's going to make yards and big plays. So you want to get a guy like that the ball. When you were out there, what did you learn from a Jerry Rice? 
what, what kind of things does he teach, even a veteran like you? Well, the work that, I mean, he worked real hard. I mean, he put a full day in. When he go to work, he put a full day in. I always consider myself as when I go to work, to give uh, 110%. And this guy do it every day uh, at work, too. So, I mean, he shows you a lot when he get on the field. 49ers, for years, everybody talks about their offense, but that 49ers defense has been pretty good the last couple of years, if you remember. Well, they had a lot of veterans the last couple of years, and they uh, brought like seven guys in my first year there, and uh, they got a lot of uh, old leaders there, and they make a big difference. Yeah, passing game, they not only like to bring the great pressure from the outside, but they also, they bring that heat in the passing. They're not afraid to blitz their corners a little bit. Well, they blitz their corners a lot. That's, that's Pete Carroll, and uh, he likes the corner blitz a lot. And uh, Saints use it uh, quite a bit now uh, with the uh, Tyron Hughes and those guys. So that's becoming the new thing in the NFL, bringing the corners and the safeties uh, on the outside. Final question, what's the key to Sunday for the Saints? How, they, how will they be able to beat the 49ers? Well, I'll get about 24 points. I mean, get enough points that we can let the defense work, and uh, that's going to be the key to it. I mean, make sure we go out and try to get some points. All right, Ricky, thanks for joining us. And, of course, Ricky will be with us every single Sunday night. He will join us from 3 Com Park next week in San Francisco. All Saints will come to you with a special stadium show from San Francisco next Sunday night. Ricky will be with us then, and, of course, he'll be with us the rest of the season right here on All Saints. Now, we've got to take a break, but when we come back, the Saints players and the coaches will talk about opening with the 49ers. Stick around. All Saints will be right back. Welcome back to All Saints. Next Sunday, the Saints will find out exactly where they stand in the NFC West because they'll be playing the team picked to win the West, the San Francisco 49ers. There will be no quarterback rotation in this one, no starters coming out at halftime. Every play counts from here on out. And it's, it's the best situation for us to start off with San Francisco, with the team that uh, everyone thinks is, is the best. So uh, we're going to really find out where we stand this, this offseason. They've been the best in our division, and we want to be the best. And it's time for us to, uh, to start striding out. I'm ready for the 49ers. Uh, you know, it's my first time. This is our rivalry here. So, um, you know, we're just going to go out there and uh, see, what, see what happens. There's an underlying feeling among the players that it's better to catch the 49ers early, before they have a chance to get rolling. But since 1967, the Niners are 15 and 14 in opening day games. In the last 10 years, dating back to 1986, the 49ers have won eight of their 10 season openers. And in the five times the 49ers and Saints have played in the first game of the season, the Niners are 5-0. There really is no good time to catch San Francisco, except maybe after an injury to Steve Young or Jerry Rice. Whenever you play, you just want to play your, your best. And, and uh, you know, they're going to be playing their best against us because they know that we've got a good young squad and they're going to have to be facing us again. But, uh, um, you know, this is a big division game right off the start. I think everyone understands that. Uh, and everyone will be prepared for it. And hopefully we're going to play our best football. And now it's time. Now it's time to play, uh, put up or shut up. I mean, it's a situation we've been waiting for these whole five preseason games. It's been a long preseason. But, I mean, I think we played well overall the past two games and we're starting to play together and starting to jail and it's just a matter of going out there Sunday and execute. Rookie Alex Molden is looking forward to this game for a number of reasons. It'll be his first NFL regular season game and it comes against Jerry Rice who Molden worked out against during the offseason. You know working out with him for like it was three or four months it kind of you know it kind of it's not going to be too much of a uh, you know a shocker you know going up against him. I mean, it's going to be kind of, you know, kind of familiar, but with the, you know, you throwing the fans and, the, you know, in the hype of the game, it's going to be a little different. There's going to be some, you know, some butterflies in my stomach, but, uh, you know, I'm going to be okay, though. Molden and the Saints defensive backs will not see wide receiver John Taylor this year. He has retired. They will see J.J. Stokes and Nate Singleton. Now, the 49ers running game is suspect with Derek Lavelle, Tommy Vardell, and newly acquired Terry Kirby. 
nobody stands out there, and that's the one weakness the 49ers have. They do not have a powerful running game like mm -hmm. they had when Ricky Waters was there. I believe the Saints' defense is a key. If they can hold those Niners down, stop the running game, I think the Saints can win this football game. Just to piggyback on what you say, Lionel, I think it'll also be important to see how the Saints' defense can try and shut down Steve Young. Because if the 49ers can't get that running game going, hopefully the Saints' defense will rush Young, and then it'll be a matter of if they can keep him in the pocket, keep him from getting off, getting to the sidelines, gaining those big chunks of yardage, and that's where he can really hurt you. Also, the Saints' running game has to get going. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about this one. If Mario Bates does not have a good game, the Saints will not win. Bank on it. Well, the thing you guys, neither of you guys have talked about is their 49ers offensive line. They have got three of their five starters right now. Scrafford, Sapolo, a couple other guys. They are all banged up. Right. The other day, in only a quarter and a half, Steve Young was sacked three, <laughs> three times. times. He came out of the game because he was hurt. So you've talked about an offensive line. Not only do they have to protect Steve Young, they got to block for that running game you're talking about, and they got to protect him so they can do that vertical passing game. Jerry Rice isn't going to do anything but those three and four yard slants if they can't protect Steve Young. And I think that's going to be a real key. The second key for the Saints offensive line, you go right back around, they've got to be able to handle that 49ers front four. Barker, Dolman, uh, the two big guys up front, Bryant Young, Dana Stubblefield, that's the key. If they can handle the upfront game, I think really the Saints have got a real chance. The key is going to be the offensive and defensive lines. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, when the Saints used to beat the 49ers of old, Ricky Jackson was coming up on the end and getting pressure on Steve Young. And that's what you have to do. You've got to get in there, sack Steve Young, hurry him up, don't let him get set. If he doesn't get set, he can't find the receivers. And right. the other thing, if you get that West Coast offense going, I think it will be important for the Saints secondary to make those quick tackles and, and not give Rice those yak yards, the yards after the catch. If the Saints can keep those down to a minimum, it'll be to their advantage as well. Yeah, good thing is Ricky Jackson will be in candle, uh, three count part. <laughs> Bad thing is he's going to not be in uniform. <laughs> We got to pay a few more bills, but stick around. Up next, we'll check out the rest of the NFC West and we'll get some final thoughts on the 49ers Saints game. All Saints will be right back. It's one of those events that only happen once a year and it's not your anniversary. It's the Toyota Nationwide Clearance. Get time he dropped a quarterback, he raised our spirits. Every time he stopped the other guys, he got us started. Every time he took the field, he gave us hope. Now it's time for us to give him our hearts. On September 8th, the New Orleans Saints honor Ricky Jackson in the Superdome. Turn out to cheer for him the way he always turned out for us. Welcome back to All Saints. The teams in the NFC West don't waste any time jump, jumping into the conference schedule. The Rams, who host the Bengals, are the only team not playing in the conference. Carolina hosts Atlanta, and the Saints travel to the city by the bay. And that's where we begin this week's edition of the rest of the West. The Saints may be catching a break when it comes to playing the Niners this early in the season. Heat has been a problem at San Francisco's Rockland, California training camp. 17 100 plus scorching days have limited a lot of the Niners preseason work, but that hasn't stopped the progress of their defensive line. A pair of free agent pickups play the role of bookends. Former Falcon and Viking Chris Dolman on one end and former Viking Roy Barker on the other. Barker says he's excited about playing for a team that is gunning for nothing less than a Super Bowl championship. I don't, even, I don't remember anybody saying anything about the division. You know, it's, it's home field advantage to the Super Bowl. That's, and, and that's good. You know, you know it's, it's good to be with a team that set their standards that high, you know, which makes you set yours very high. On offense, the Niners are trying to find an answer to what ails their ground game, filling up the tank, if you will. From the August 19th Sports Illustrated, the 49ers' brain trust went into this offseason with an urgent mission to revive a running game that by the end of 95 had been given up for dead. Niner fans hope the mission ends with the acquisition of former Dolphin Terry Kirby, who debuted in a Niner uniform Friday night. The Niners couldn't slow Seattle's pass rush, though, and Steve Young was sacked three times on the way to a 20-3 loss. 
In St. Louis, the quarterback controversy rages on. Michigan State rookie Tony Banks is making headlines. From this week's Pro Football Weekly, we're told he could end up being a factor a lot sooner than anyone expected. Bad news for ex-Saint Steve Walsh. Banks has drummed up the press after going 20 for 28 for 219 yards and no interceptions in his first two preseason games. And at Panther camp, Dom Capers' defense is poised to try and improve on the club's stellar 7-9 expansion season. Ex-Saint Sam Mills will again quarterback the Panther D. I think we're doing pretty good, uh, you know, on paper. You know, we look good. But we got to go out there and we got to do it. Last year, we, we, we were able to go out and do the things we thought we can do and, uh, you know, get after some quarterbacks and, and really shut down some offenses. This year, with the addition of some players, we should be able to do that. But it's just a matter of going out there and making it happen. And Mills was making it happen again this weekend against the New York Giants. Mouse picks off the Dave Brown pass and goes the distance for the interception return touchdown. And another former Saint is quickly becoming Kerry Collins' favorite target. Wesley Walls hauls in the easy TD catch, and the Panthers drill the Giants 34-7. And that's the rest of the West. So there you see the Saints' main competitors this season are probably going to be the 49ers and the Panthers, and they're looking good as we head into this season. Although, like we were saying before, that 49er offensive line looks as though it may be able to be exploited. I think, as we said before, that'll be important for the Saints to do. Yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, you open up with the 49ers, you come back the next week at home against the Panthers, Sam Mills, Wesley Walls are going to be in there, Ricky Jackson Day. I think these first two games are mm -hmm. going to be very important. The Saints have to have to really look good against the 49ers, if not win the game, and come back home on Ricky Jackson's day and beat the Panthers to get off to a good start. If they, if they start off 1-1, uh, one and one, I think it looks pretty good. If they go 0-2, oh, oh Jimmy, they're in trouble. All right, prediction time. You start, Lionel. What do you like uh, coming up Sunday? Sun Sunday, I like the Saints to go in there and, uh, and beat the 49ers. You pointed out the offensive line. They don't have a good running game. I think the Saints' defense is much improved. If Darren Mickle's in there, Fred Stokes is lending some support. I think they can go in there and beat the Niners. Show real quick. Uh, Doug Bryan, warm up your leg. The game may be on his <laughs> foot again. All right, so we like three for three. We'll go for the Saints that this week. That's it for this week's edition of All Saints. Next Sunday, the Saints and the 49ers will meet right here on Fox 8 at 3 p.m. Then Ricky, Lionel, and I will take the show on the road. We'll come to you from All Saints. We'll be at San Francisco's 3Com Park. We'll have all the post-game reaction for you from the stadium next week. And of course, Joe will be holding down the fort right here in the studio. The regular season, it's here, folks, and it begins with the 49ers next Sunday. So we'll see you then on All Saints. Good night, everybody. Senate debate, Tuesday night at 9 on Fox 8. Coming up on All Saints, Jim Everett and the Saints offense sputters in week one. Meanwhile, Steve Young and the Niners hit the ground running. We'll get thoughts from a former Niner and Saint, Ricky Jackson, and what kind of spin will head coach Jim Mora put on his team's inauspicious 96 debut? We'll have that answer, plus a look around the NFC West, straight ahead on All Saints. It's the start of a new season, and we've got a new look here on All Saints, folks. It's our brand new All Saints studio, a little more empty this week than it will normally be. That's because Jim Gallagher and Lionel Bienvenu are both still in San Francisco, and they join us now live. Guys, and I guess it was probably even more brutal to watch in person than it was on TV. Yeah, Joe, you think how ugly it was back at watching it on your set. It was doubly worth seeing it here in person, 27 to 11. The offense bad, the defense bad. Lionel, it was bad. Yeah, Jim, we're going to hear from the, uh, the locker room talk about the, uh, the Saints players. Did Jim ever talk about his bad day? Defense couldn't stop him in the first half. Down 24 to nothing, the Saints found themselves. We'll also go one-on-one -on -one with Ricky right. Jackson. He came back here. Uh, he played here for two years with the 49ers, came back as a Saint today, and we'll get his thoughts also. We'll go one-on-one -on -one with Jim Moore. The spin he put on it was the defense played much better in the second half. That's one of the very few positives from this ball game. No doubt about it, Joe. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes here. But right now, let's go back to you in the studio, and let's check out the highlights from this one. All right, guys, hang tight. We'll be right back with you. Of course, the Saints had such high expectations coming into this game, but instead, the Niners dominated just about every aspect of the contest. Jim Mora had to be steaming on the sidelines watching this one from 3 Com Park. The Niners get going early, and you know how they do it. Yeah, Young to Jerry Rice there for the nice gain. 
That would set up touchdown Tommy Vardell. He lives up to his name here. He pokes in there for the touchdown. That makes it 7-0, the Niners on top. They would waste no time coming right back, still in the first quarter. Young looking, not finding. He goes to his second al almost more deadly option, his feet. He gets the big gainer on the run there, a 20-plus yard gain. Then it's Young surveying the field again, the skinny post pattern, and he finds Jerry Rice, who beats Eric Allen, that one all the way deep into St. Territory. Then the trick play. Rice comes back around on the end around. He gets into the corner of the end zone for the touchdown. A penalty on the Saints as well. Nothing going at all really in the first half for the Saints. The running game there. Mario Bates stuffed after a short gain. He gains just 30 yards in the afternoon. That won't get it done. Meanwhile, the Saints punting to New Orleans native Nate Singleton. He makes the nice move at the 35. Cuts it up. Finds a short seam. Gets about 20 yards there. That gets the Niners back in good field position. They make it count again. This time, Derek Laville from four yards out. He fights his way in, finds the small seam in the Saints defense and scores another touchdown, 24 zip at the half. The Saints try and come back just before the half driving, but Tim McDonald steps in front of this Jim Everett pass and he picks it off and that ends the Saints threat. 24 nothing, the score at the half. We fast forward to the fourth quarter. The Saints finally get something going. Everett hits the youngster. Hank Lusk, he gets the nice gain there. 20 plus yards on the hookup to the tight end. Then the only Saints touchdown of the day. Everett to Haywood Jeffries in the corner. He beats Marquez Pope. One more look at it. Shows a nice pitch and catch. Saints fans hoping to see a lot more of this. Lofted up nicely there for Jeffries for the only Saints touchdown of the day. The Saints then, they call a trick play of their own. They fake the extra point. Klaus Wimsmeyer holds on. He would go in for the two point conversion. Again, uh, as the old cliche goes, far too little, far too late. And the Saints would end up going down in this one. The final score, 27 to 11. So the Saints begin their year with a disappointing loss. For more post-game reaction, we'll take you back to San Francisco, where again, Jim and Lionel are standing by. Guys? Joe, thank you very much. Let's start with the Saints defense, and they struggled early on in this game because of that 49er offense. You know what Steve Young can do. You know what Jerry Rice can do. And those guys hooked up all game long, and they really dominated this game. Let's take a listen to what the Saints defenders had to say, first of all, about trying to stop Steve Young and Jerry Rice. I said before the game, I think the key thing would be third downs. Uh, we were horrible. Uh, you know, either uh, you know the route wasn't there, or we didn't catch it, or or what have you. But uh, we're not we're not good enough to to just show up and, and beat people, especially uh, teams that uh, that are very very good, like 49ers. But yep. but they played extremely well. Well, an offensive unit is not in sync. Uh, nothing goes right. Uh, I don't I don't care what personnel you have out there on the field. I think that's what happened up to us today. We just didn't never have a, a opportunity to just put maybe uh, eight to ten plays in a row where we were getting some consistency. We were going three and out too many times. So hopefully we can make some adjustments for us next week. They're, um, you know, accustomed to running the points up and getting up on people. I mean, and, and once they get up on you, it's hard to, to beat them. But if you stay even with them and you and have a chance to win the fourth quarter, that's how you beat this team. Against a team like that, you got to be standing toe to toe. And uh, we took we took a couple big hits early and, and, and couldn't make it up. What does this team have to do now to, to bounce back? From well, we got to just keep our belief in ourselves. I mean, there's a lot of guys that are going to make plays on this football team, and we got to keep the belief and keep growing. Uh, uh, we got a lot of new faces on this team, and, and uh, these guys, we're all going to be we're all going to be good. It's just a matter of coming together, and hopefully, we can take it out on the Panthers. The Panthers are the next opponent. Now, of course, obviously, that was the Saints' offensive players talking about their performance, which wasn't exactly very good either. You look at the numbers; were very rough. Jim Everett only completed 16 passes. The running game only rushed for 56 yards today. The offense had trouble, but Lionel, as we were talking about a moment ago, the defense also had trouble, and we had a chance to talk to some of the defensive players. Right, Jimmy, you brought up 56 yards rushing for the Saints offense. Steve Young by himself had 52 yards rushing, so he almost beat the entire Saints team. Saints struggled on offense. Uh, Drop passes, I can tell you that. Torrance Small is supposed to take up for Quinn Early. He's nowhere close, but on defense, the Saints couldn't stop the 49ers when it counted. It seemed like a penalty, a missed assignment, a blown coverage, or Steve Young scrambling always seemed to get that first down and get the 49ers in position to score. Here's what some of the defenders had to say in the locker room. I think we just let them get up on us too fast. And um, 
you know, they did a lot of good things out there, you know, on their part. Uh, but, you know, when, when you let a team like that get up, you know, 20-something points on you, and then you got to come out the third quarter, it's difficult trying to come back. Somebody looked at the score, 24 nothing at halftime, uh, and said, oh, the 49ers are so much yeah. better. Are they that much better than the Saints? No, not at all. I think we just didn't, uh, we didn't pick it up quick enough in the first half. That's all. I think it's positive. We got a positive outlook. We just need to go back and break down that first half and see why, what happened, why we didn't pick it up. You know, it could be a, a number of things. Once we look at that film and we break that down, we'll be okay. We, we gave them too many things on defense. We, we made a couple mistakes, and it weren't major mistakes, but the thing is with San Fran, what they do is capitalize on the mistakes you do make. Um, too many penalties. <laughs> too many penalties. Too many second chances. Oh, they did a lot of things, scrambling wise, hitting open guy, waiting for us to break down. We didn't play particularly well in the zones early on. You know, we were getting sucked up and just wasn't playing very well. And he took advantage of it. Hey, Jimmy, I know I picked the 49ers to lose this game. I thought the Saints right. would come out. I thought they would win this game because of their new defense. I thought the defense mm -hmm. would be better. But I think we underestimated the 49ers a little bit. They, they may have been beaten up on the offensive line. Now, John Taylor's gone. A lot of things. They didn't have a good running game. But apparently they pulled it together, and the 49ers are a very good football team. Right. Your superstars are still your superstars right. in this league. Steve Young, Jerry Rice, and they really dominated when they needed to dominate. That wraps it up, at least for now. And, of course, we got a lot more coming at you from right outside a three-com park here in San Francisco. When we come back, we'll go one-on-one -on -one with the fourth member of the All Saints team, Ricky Jackson. He had to hop a plane back, but we had a chance to go one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll get his thoughts in just a couple of minutes live from here in three com. Joe? All right, thanks a lot, guys. We'll be back with y'all in just a few moments. But, folks, we've got to take our first break here on All Saints. Stay with us because, as Jim said, one of the Saints' best players ever We'll talk to us here on All Saints. Ricky Jackson played for the Saints and the Niners. We'll have his take on week one. That's up next on All Saints. Each week here on All Saints, we'll have a special bit of insight from a special player for you. Ricky Jackson has joined the Fox 8 All Saints team. Let's go back live to San Francisco now, where Jim Gallagher got a chance to catch up with old number 57 after the game. Jimmy? Thank you very much, Joe. No doubt about that. We had a chance to talk to Ricky Jackson. He played a couple of years out here. Now, he had to jump on the team plane, so it was a little rough. We couldn't have him here live with us tonight, obviously. But we did have a chance to talk to Ricky before he left, and let's listen to what he had to say about today's game. Ricky, I guess there's no other way to put it, but this was an ug ugly loss today. I mean, we did some great things in the second half. Uh, we got more points, about eight points more of them in the second half, which uh, really, you know, the first half, they kind of dominated and got 24 points. And anytime you know, a great team like this jump out and get ahead of you, it's kind of rough to come back. So, you know, we hung in there and played well at the second half, but the first half, we let them got away. You're not surprised you play with these guys. You know how hard it is against Steve Young and, and Jerry Rice, but they really did take it to the Saints early on in this game. Well, I mean, early in the game, when Jerry and Steve hooked up a couple of times they did, it set the uh, tone for the game. And uh, if you don't, you, you keep them from getting off their uh, quick, fast start like, like they did, we, we had a chance. But once you let them get out there and, and get the rolling and making the crowd get into the game, make it rough on you. Eric Allen said this team probably played a little too much zone and, and they were able to take advantage of it today. Well, I mean, I, 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 I can't uh, say, you know, what they played or anything, but I know that we didn't press Jerry enough. I mean, he got off the line pretty good and uh, he had a chance to have some success. So in the future, we know that, you know, if you're going to stop uh, falling down, you got to hold Jerry at the line a little more and be a little more physical on him because he sets the tone of the game. And you got to contain Steve Young. When he gets out, he can really be a bad Well, I mean, he can run. Everybody know that. You got to spy somebody on him. And, uh, you know, something's going to come up short. So anything come up short, as long as you hold Jerry and Steve, let them beat you with the other people. And, I mean, that's basically it. I guess, too, when you get down, it's hard to get that ball moving once you get down 24 nothing. Well, I mean, they got the number one defense in football. A lot of people uh, fail to realize that the last two years they've been number one defense in football. So, I mean, they don't, they don't have a defense that you can uh, mess around with. They got a great defense. And uh, they replaced two or three guys, you know, and uh, they still brought some uh, good pass rushes in and some more good players in. So, their defense still ranked real high. So, 
order to beat them guys, you got to make sure that, you know, you get some turnovers and stuff on your defense. Because they got, they're going to get turnovers on their defense. I think they got like two or three turnovers a day. And I mean, anytime you get two or three turnovers, they're going to help out a lot. Were you surprised as badly as they played in the preseason, how well they were able to come out and play today? Well, that don't count to them. I mean, that, that don't mean anything. There's a big boys playing now. I mean, that, that preseason stuff. Everybody Rucker came in today zero and zero, and uh, the big boys show you that preseason don't mean nothing. And uh, they came out today and got 24 points real quick to show us that hey, you know, we're coming to play the ball game. 15 games left to go. What does this team need to do to rebound? And they need to probably do it pretty quickly. Well, uh, you know, Carolina got a good team too. I mean, they got a lot of veterans over there, and uh, they they building a hell of a program. So. We got our work cut out for the, this week, too, going to Carolina. Because, I mean, for them to come up and beat Atlanta 29-6 to six like they did, I mean, that show you right there that they quarterback the first couple of picks last year, and uh, he coming on. And, I mean, he getting smarter. I mean, right now, they got some good receivers that came along. They got a great defense. Now they had 